This is part 3 of the Bizarre Animal Iceberg where we'll be going over tiers 5 and 6. Just like before, things are just gonna keep on getting stranger and stranger. Very interesting. Love them animals. I'll start keeping these intros brief going forward cause, well, you kinda know what you're getting into at this point. So let's just get right into it with... Mata Mata the Mata Mata is a freshwater turtle found in the Amazon. French naturalist Pierre Barrère described them as large land turtles with spiky and rigid scales. They are identified by their long carapace, measuring up to 95 centimeters. It is an aquatic species that lives in water shallow enough to breathe out of its long, snorkel-like nostrils. As the Mata Mata remains motionless, its body is made to look like a piece of wood, and its skin flaps move with the vegetation, helping the Mata Mata blend into its surroundings. Marsupial Mole the marsupial mole is a marsupial specialized to living most of its life underground. This plus its appearance gets them often mistaken for regular moles, particularly the golden mole, which they are not. It's just another example of convergent evolution. They only really come to surface after rainfall, they're functionally blind and have no external ears. Like all marsupials, the marsupial mole does have a pouch. This one is facing backwards so sand doesn't fill it up while digging. The marsupial mole is so rare that very little is actually known about them. They don't survive in captivity either, so they've become quite the mystery. Nobody knows how they find each other, how they mate, how they behave, etc. They don't dig burrows like the naked mole rat and instead seem to just swim through the sand aimlessly. Paca the paca is a large ground-dwelling rodent, typically with spots or stripes on its sides. The species was originally from South America, but migrated to Central America about 3 million years ago during the Great American Interchange. Which, if you don't know what the Great American Interchange is, basically a lot of animals in North and South America kinda swapped places. The paca itself isn't all that bizarre, really just unknown to the general public. They live in rainforests and eat fruits like normal. I guess it's a little strange to call something that looks like this a rodent, but whatever, that's what it is. Bombardier Beetle The Bombardier Beetle is a group of beetles that is actually able to shoot fire at potential threats. Well, actually they shoot a hot noxious chemical spray from the tip of the abdomen, but that doesn't sound as cool. I'm no chemist, but here's some of the reactions for those of you that are. The beetle is believed to evolve this trait by mixing hydroquinone found in all carabid beetles with hydrogen peroxide. The chemical reaction produces a lot of heat and pressure, and some beetles will leak that onto the skin when threatened. The bombardier beetle was able to use the muscle that prevents leakage and develop it into a more controllable attack. Bombardier beetles live on every continent except Antarctica, living near moist areas where they can lay their eggs. They're carnivorous and hunt primarily at night to catch other bugs. Goliath Beetle the Goliath beetle is a really big, really cool looking beetle, measuring up to 110 millimeters. Like most big beetles, these guys will hang out on trees and eat sap. In the Goliath beetle's case, they'll hang out in forests all over Africa. The Goliath beetle needs an unusually high protein diet, but scientists have discovered that you can really just feed them dog and cat food and they'll grow no problem. And if you're wondering, yeah, the larvae's huge too. I'm sorry. Once they reach maturity, Goliath beetles will get these cool markings and the males will develop a Y-shaped horn to use in battle. Basking Shark The basking shark is a shark with a big mouth, something like up to a meter wide. They can be found all over the world's temperate oceans, and just like the whale shark, is a filter feeder. It uses highly developed bristle-like gill rakers to filter out plankton as water fills the mouth and gills. Basking sharks have been observed breaching the water's surface, sometimes even jumping out entirely. It's unknown why they do this, but scientists speculate that large marine animals like whales and sharks breach as a threat display to show off their size and strength. Despite that, just like the whale shark, basking sharks are no real threat to humans. They only eat tiny plankton, so something as big as a human would be no use to them. The basking sharks' populations have reduced a lot due to overhunting for things like shark fin or shark liver oil. Overexploitation has gotten to the point where some populations have disappeared outright. Vaquita the vaquita is a porpoise endemic to the Gulf of California. It is the smallest living cetacean, with the smaller males only reaching 140 centimeters. There's not a whole lot to say about this one other than its size, but it's probably on here because they're on the brink of extinction. Estimates say that there's only about 10 individuals left in the wild. This rapid decline of the vaquita is due to them unintentionally getting caught and drowning in fish nets by illegal fishing operations in marine protected areas. Goliath Frog the goliath frog is the largest living species of frog, growing up to 32 centimeters in length. They can only be found in this little part of Cameroon and Equatorial Guinea. Just like the last two, the goliath frog is also endangered. This is due to factors like habitat loss, overhunting, pet trade, but also due to non-human factors like parasites. The goliath frog is omnivorous. They eat a large variety of food, hunting both in the water and out of it. Because they are so big, they can really only live in dense equatorial forests near waterfalls. They make their own nests by moving rocks and digging little ponds for their eggs. Despite their enormous size as mature adults, goliath frog eggs and tadpoles are about the same size as other frogs. Malayan Kalugo 
The Malayan Kalugo is a species of Kalugo native to Southeast Asia, ranging from Middle Vietnam all the way down through Indonesia. They're sometimes called Sunda flying lemur because even though they're not technically lemurs, they're most closely related to small primates. Kalugos are arboreal mammals that glide using a padded geum stretching from the neck to the toes. They are skilled climbers and can glide 100 meters without losing much height. That large membrane taking up all their leg room does, however, make them pretty helpless on the ground. The Kalugo forages through the trees at night, looking for shoots, flowers, and fruits to eat. A mother will give birth to a single young, who will cling onto their mother's abdomen for the first six months, not reaching full maturity for about three years. Lion's Mane Jellyfish the lion's mane jellyfish is a species of jellyfish living in the cold waters of the northern Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. It is one of the largest species of jellyfish, with the largest recorded specimen reaching up to 36.6 meters long. The name lion's mane comes from its long hair-like tentacles. Young ones will be colorless or a lighter orange, but they'll get darker and more red as they mature. While most jellyfish have a smooth, circular bell, the lion's mane's bell is divided into eight distinct lobes, each with a balancing sensory organ called a ropalium that helps the jellyfish orient itself. Each lobe contains 70 to 150 tentacles that it uses to sting and catch prey. In humans, these stings can cause a little pain and a little redness, but it is not known to be fatal. It should be noted, however, that if you get a lot of stings or are stung over a large portion of your body, you should get it checked out just to be safe. Amplibagi Amplibagi, also known as the tailless whip scorpion, is an order of arachnid found worldwide. They prefer warm environments where they can stay hidden away under leaves or caves. Amplibagi cannot produce silk and do not have venomous fangs. They do have elongated jaw limbs called pedipalps that are used to catch prey, sort of like the mantis from the insects. Their first pair of legs aren't used for walking. They're long and thin and are used as sensory organs, extending well past the length of the body. Some species are among very few arachnids that exhibit social behavior. Mothers communicate with their young via those antennae form legs and the offspring reciprocate both with their mother and siblings. The reasoning behind this is still unknown. Shrimp fish the shrimp fish has nothing to do with shrimp, other than the fact that they live in the ocean, I guess. They're thin with long pointed snouts. The shrimp fish is also sometimes called the razor fish, which IMO is a much more fitting name. Shrimp fish live in shallow waters off the coast of the Indo-Pacific. They're nearly transparent and swim in a synchronized downward position. This may look weird, but it helps them fit in and hide under sea stuff like urchins and such. It also kind of makes them look like leaves, but I don't know if that helps. This position can also help them find little things to eat on the ground. Brain Coral Brain coral is actually a name used for various species of coral that, well, look like a brain. They can be found in shallow waters all across the world. Each head of the coral is made up of a colony of polyps, which secrete hard calcium carbonate, making the quote-unquote skeleton. This makes them important coral reef builders. At night, brain coral will catch food using their sweeping tentacles. In coral, each polyp will have a sort of mouth tentacle, typically with stinging cells, that it uses to catch and eat food, as well as defend itself in its territory. Some species, like those in the genera Favia, can be pretty aggressive with other coral. American Paddlefish the American paddlefish is a big fish with a paddle on its face. It's a smooth-skinned, freshwater fish with a skeleton entirely made up of cartilage, kinda like sharks. The paddle-shaped rostrum extends one-third of the length of the body, and has thousands of sensory receptors that help the paddlefish find swarms of zooplankton, making it a filter feeder. The American paddlefish, native to the Mississippi River, is the last living species of paddlefish, with its closest living relatives being sturgeons. The paddlefish used to be a bit more widespread, most famously with the recently extinct Chinese paddlefish from the Yangtze River last seen in 2003. The American paddlefish population isn't that low. It is classified as vulnerable, but it's sustainable enough to be a very popular sport fish. Napoleon Wrasse the Napoleon wrasse, also known as the humphead wrasse, is a big blue fish with a big funny face. They can be found in coral reefs around the East African coast and Indo-Pacific. The Napoleon wrasse is the largest living species of wrasse, with the males reaching up to 2 meters. They live a long time too, something like around 30 years. They are protogynous hermaphrodites. Most are born females, but around 9 years old, some will change to male. The factors that control this change are still unknown, but it is pretty cool. The Napoleon wrasse is now endangered due to a whole laundry list of reasons. Maybe the the biggest factor in this is severe overfishing. It's tricky, because fishing is a vital industry to the impoverished state of Sabah, and banning the fish has not prevented illegal and unregulated fishing. It's not just here though, because these illegal activities are done the same all over the rice's habitat. Mekong Giant Catfish 
The Mekong giant catfish is a critically endangered species of shark catfish, which is a thing I just learned existed. They live in the Mekong Basin over here in Southeast Asia. This is another one that's on here because it's really big, growing up to 3 meters. They have teeth when they're young, that's something. Here's a cool thing from a temple in Chiang Kong. The Mekong giant catfish is very endangered, but on the bright side, they are being successfully bred in Thailand and are sometimes hybridized with the iridescent shark to make the Mekong iridescent shark. That's amazing. Mustard Coral Mustard coral lives in colonies in the West Atlantic Ocean up and down the Americas. I just talked about coral and these guys are pretty similar so I won't go over everything again. One interesting thing about this coral is that they can perform photosynthesis through a symbiotic relationship with a microscopic algae that it catches called zooxanthella. This is a thing a lot of coral do, I just figured I'd bring it up with this one. Green Humphead Parrotfish the green humphead parrotfish is the largest living species of parrotfish, which are basically just fish with beak-like mouthparts. They are completely herbivorous and feed on benthic algae, sometimes using their hard teeth to ram into coral and kinda shake them out. Other parrotfish will use their teeth for different modes of feeding, depending on how strong their jaws are. These groups are called excavators, which our green humphead is, scrapers, which do kinda the same thing but with less power, and browsers, who primarily feed on sea grasses. Unlike other parrotfish, the green humphead is also completely covered in scales. They live a long time too, up to 40 years. As they grow older into adulthood, the fish develops a bulbous forehead and their teeth plates become more exposed. Paku The Paku is a fish from South America with a very unnerving set of human-like teeth and are somewhat unsurprisingly related to the piranha. That makes two fish with teeth in a row, what a world. Unlike piranha, Paku primarily feed on plant material. They're often sold as exotic pets cause, I don't know, I guess people can't get enough of those teeth. Anyway, this has led them to becoming invasive species all over the world. Apparently, the Paku has been accused of being a fish that will bite people's testicles, which is an uncomfortable thought to say the least. Nevertheless, this claim is not true. Jaguarundi the Jaguarundi is a medium-sized wild cat living in Central and South America, east of the Andes. They are characterized by their long bodies, long tails, and small head. The Jaguarundi is actually more active during the day, living either solitary or in a pair. They're good climbers but prefer to hunt on the ground, going after ground-feeding birds, reptiles, or rodents. The name Jaguarundi comes from the old Guarani word, Jaguarundi, which unsurprisingly means dark jaguar, in reference to the other big cat from South America. Despite this, Jaguarundi are part of the Puma lineage and are therefore more closely related to cougars. Kissing Gorami the Kissing Gorami is the most romantic fish in the Great Sundas. They are freshwater fish in the labyrinth fish family, which are fish that have pseudo lungs called a labyrinth organ, which is a really cool name for fake lungs by the way. They use these organs to take in oxygen directly from the air instead of using their gills to get it from the water. The Kissing Gorami is typically pale pink or greenish and has a forward protruding mouth that makes it look like it's always trying to get a smooch. These lips are lined with horny teeth and the shape and flexibility of the mouth help the fish get benthic algae or aquatic plants. Even in insects at the surface aren't safe from getting a fatal kiss. These fish will even kiss each other sometimes, but this isn't your typical Valentine's Day treat. It is thought that when acting aggressive, these fish will engage in little mouth fights, which is kind of pathetic. It's not 100% confirmed that's what's going on here. Nobody knows for sure why they do this. That's just what the experts say is probably going on. Irrawaddy Dolphin the Irrawaddy dolphin is a dolphin found along the coasts and in rivers in Southeast Asia. I'm gonna be honest, these guys aren't that strange. They do typical dolphin things like high communication with clicks and buzzes and such. They do look a little strange, I guess. Their dorsal fin is all the way back here and they have a huge melon making them kind of look like belugas. These dolphins have a mutualistic relationship with fishers, fishing alongside them in India. Fishermen will tap a wooden key called Iahai Kwe to get the dolphin's attention and then the dolphin will help drive fish into their nets, catching a few for themselves in the process. Irrawaddy dolphin are threatened most notably by getting caught in fishing equipment, but also things like dams and boats. Oarfish Oarfish are real-life sea monsters living all over the world's oceans, ranging from 250 meters to 1,000 meters in depth. The giant oarfish in particular is the largest bony fish, growing up to 11 meters. They're typically big, very long, and freakishly cool. On top of that, they have a big red crest accompanied by an elongated dorsal fin running all the way down its back. They propel themselves by keeping their body flat and undulating the dorsal fin, and can use this method to swim vertically. This orientation helps them see silhouettes of their prey through the downstreaming light from above. They'll catch pretty much whatever they can find but primarily feed on zooplankton. Sheep's head fish. The sheep's head is yet another fish with teeth, and it does similar things to all the other fish with teeth we talked about. They use these teeth to crush open food like bivalves and crustaceans. This species lives in coastal waters along the western Atlantic and has cool black stripes. I don't know what to tell you with this one, it's another fish with teeth. Next. 
Reef Stonefish The reef stonefish is a crusty, bulbous, ray-finned fish living in the shallow waters of the Red Sea and Indo-Pacific. They are closely related to the scorpion fish, and with a name like scorpion, you can infer that this guy is dangerous. In fact, stonefish is the deadliest fish in the sea, with highly lethal venom. The fins of the stonefish are lined with a bunch of spines that deliver the venom, which sucks for anyone else because their weird skin and texture help them remain hidden away, right where you might accidentally step or brush your arm against. The spines are sharp enough to pierce through boot soles, so be careful. No matter how you look at it, they're very well protected animals. When the stonefish hunts, it sits motionless on the floor, waiting for smaller fish or something similar to come by. It lunges and engulfs the prey at extremely high speeds, with their strike being recorded at 0.015 seconds. Jackson's Chameleon Jackson's chameleon is sometimes called the three-horned chameleon due to those epic horns on the front of its head, which kind of make them look like a triceratops. This trait is mostly found in males, and females will either have no horns or little traces of the rostral horn. Jackson's chameleon is native to East Africa, but its popularity as a pet has introduced it to places like Hawaii or Florida where it has become an invasive species. Like most chameleons, Jackson's chameleons prey primarily on small insects, using their long sticky tongue to quickly grapple them. Though slow moving, the retractable tongue is very fast and powerful, and pair well with their independently moving eyes, which help them lock onto their target. They also have a strong grip thanks to those claw machine-like hands and prehensile tail. Viperfish Viperfish are species of marine fish mostly found in the mesopelagic and bathypelagic zone, at depths of 500 to 2500 meters. However, at night, viperfish will come up to hunt. The most noticeable trait of the viperfish are the long needle-like teeth, which sure look painful to whatever unlucky fish has to deal with it. Large teeth and a wide mouth help them catch rather large prey, which is good for maximizing energy way down in the ocean. These teeth are so long that they can actually pierce through the viperfish's brain if misaligned. Viperfish are also capable of bioluminescence through photospores along the ventral side of the body that emit light through a nervous control. This light matches the amount of light already in its depths, making it difficult for larger prey to see the fish. They also use their bioluminescence to attract prey via this lure. Black-necked spitting cobra the black-necked spitting cobra is a cobra from sub-Saharan Africa growing up to 2.2 meters. They're identified by their sleek black color running along their head and back. When threatened, this cobra will flash their fangs and shoot a venom that'll irritate your skin and cause blisters. The venom isn't that deadly to us, the mortality rate in humans is very low, but it can cause permanent blindness if the venom makes contact with your eyes. This venom is primarily for small rodents, not humans. Sea Wasp the sea wasp, more commonly known as the Australian box jelly, is an extremely venomous jellyfish from northern Australia up to the Philippines and Vietnam. It is a notoriously dangerous sting delivered by millions of cnidocytes covering their long tentacles. The amount of venom in one jelly is said to be enough to kill 60 adult humans and will do so in 2-5 to five minutes. Sea wasps are the largest box jellyfish. The bell reaches around 16 centimeters in diameter, but can reach even higher up to 35 centimeters. Each of the bell's four corners holds a cluster of 15 tentacles, which they can make thinner to stretch 3 meters down. Since it is transparent, it can be very difficult to see in the water, making it incredibly dangerous to swimmers. They lack a central nervous system and simply react to different colors, with blue light eliciting feeding behavior. On the other hand, Black objects seem to cause them to go away. Their only known predators are sea turtles, who are unaffected by the sting thanks to their very thick skin. This makes sea turtles tonight's biggest hero. Cock of the Rock the cock of the rock is a bird from the rainforests of South America that has a silly, goofy name. The males of this species sport bright orange feathers and a large crest over their head. Like a lot of other birds around this area, these guys will perform a mating dance to attract their mates. This is done by sporadically flapping their wings and hopping around while giving them the look. The males are also very territorial, so the females will build their nests further away on rocky cliffs. The Andean cock of the rock is the national bird of Peru. That's, a uh, a fun fact. Black Rain Frog the black rain frog is a small, round frog that shares a lot of resemblance to the desert rain frog from the last year, which makes sense since they both belong to the same family and live in southern Africa. The black rain frog, in specific, is endemic to the southern coast of South Africa. This burrowing frog does not require water at all times like most other frogs. Instead, they use their inward-facing legs to dig dwellings and sand piles around finboss and forest fringes. In fact, these frogs prefer to stay away from water and will spend most of their time underground. They only come out at night to scavenge for food or sometimes mate. If you couldn't tell by looking at it, the black rain frog isn't exactly a great jumper or swimmer, so to ward off predators, it can puff up its body up to seven times larger than normal. This can be an effective display of intimidation, but they can also do this to jam themselves in their burrows, keeping snakes from pulling them out. And they also scream. There you go. Red-breasted goose. 
The red-breasted goose is a magnificent species of goose. They have beautiful black feathers with white markings and signature red breast. They can be a rare sight, breeding on the Tamir Peninsula in Siberia and traveling to some peninsulas along the northwest shore of the Black Sea. This is a rather small goose and can be pretty timid, so they'll make their nests close to other nests of scarier birds of prey, like snowy owls, peregrine falcons, and rough-legged buzzards. Doing this dissuades mammalian predators like arctic foxes from taking its chances and potentially dealing with the goose's frightening roommates. It's unusual for one of these birds of prey to attack the goose. Why don't they go after them? I'm gonna be honest, I have no clue. I couldn't find any reason for this. Blue-Eared Pheasant the blue-eared pheasant is a blue pheasant with a red crown from central China. They are fairly large for pheasants, up to 96 centimeters, and has long white ear coverts and long tail feathers. This is another entry that I think is only on here because they are very loud. <coughs> Males will make a series of calls that'll travel over a mile to be answered back by a similarly loud noise from a potential mate or rival. I guess another thing I can mention is that they are uncharacteristically pleasant birds. Apparently pheasants are known for being standoffish, but not these guys. Golden Snub-Nosed Monkey the golden snub-nosed monkey is an old-world monkey endemic to mountainous forests of central and southwest China where it snows frequently. As a result, they can withstand colder average temperatures better than any other non-human primate. The males are larger on average and covered with long golden guard hairs that go down their back into more brown or black hairs. These monkeys can be found in groups of 5 to 10 individuals, but can be much larger. These groups are led by an adult male and several adult females as well as their offspring. Females will tend to be much more sociable with one another than the males who stay solitary, often resting away from the rest of the group. Still. These groups will work together to protect their young, especially from threats like the northern goshawk, by placing the young at the center of the group and making an alarm call. Harpy Eagle the Harpy Eagle is the largest and strongest bird of prey in the rainforests of Central and South America. They have a wingspan up to 224 centimeters and massive talons at 12.3 centimeters in females, who tend to be bigger. Some say it's the largest species of eagle, but this is in contention with other guys like the Philippine Eagle and Stellar Sea Eagle, who are also quite big. The Harpy Eagle is pretty silent, but will sometimes make a creepy scream where it probably gets its name from. <laughs> They also make a variety of other noises too, primarily for nesting reasons like when approaching the nest with food, signals from the babies, or when humans approach. In their natural habitat, harpy eagles are at the top of the food chain. They have the largest talons of any living eagle and can carry prey up to half of their own body weight. They have a sit and wait strategy where they'll perch up high near an opening for a long period of time. When they spot potential prey, the eagle will quickly dive down to grab it. Harpy eagles are also quite capable of giving chase. They can pursue another bird mid-flight with amazing dexterity. All in all, a very effective kill machine. Mahi Mahi the mahi-mahi is a surface-dwelling ray-finned fish living off shores of temperate to tropical waters worldwide. It is also sometimes called a dorado or a dolphin, which it is neither of those things. The mahi-mahi gets its name from Hawaiian and means very strong. Ironically enough, mahi also means fish in Persian. What a crazy coincidence. Mahi-mahi have bright colors of yellow to green and blue. Their bodies are compressed with a single dorsal fin extending from the head to the tail, and the males will have prominent protruding foreheads. When taken out of the water, the fish will change color, going to silvery yellow gray, probably why the Spanish call this guy Dorado. Just so happens that there's another fish also commonly known as Dorado. Thanks guys. Mahi Mahi are among the fastest growing fish. They typically spawn in warm ocean currents and will reach maturity at about 4-5 to five months, at which point they'll reach up to 4.6 feet. Mahi Mahi are big, strong, and definitely fast, owing to their long and slender build. They can reach a max speed of 92.6 kilometers an hour, and they'll need that speed if they're gonna catch other fish or squid. Leafcutter Ant Leafcutter ant is a general name for any 47 species of leaf-chewing ants from South America reaching all the way up through Mexico. As the name suggests, these ants are well known for cutting up leaves and other vegetation then carrying it back to their nests to cultivate special fungus farms. This fungus is exclusively from the family Lepiotichae, and the ants have fully domesticated it, feeding it fresh vegetation and keeping it clean from pests and molds. In return, the fungi produce nutritious hyphal tips in these bundles called staphylae. The adults don't eat it, but their larvae rely on it, making this a completely mutualistic relationship. Like all ants, these colonies have a clear hierarchy with each type filling a specific role. Unique to leaf cutters are the minims. These are the smallest workers, whose job it is to groom the fungus and keep it healthy as well as take out the trash, or as nature calls it, waste management. When starting a colony, the queen will search for a suitable layer to start her farm. The queen comes already with the inklings of fungal mycelium stored in her infrabuckle pocket within her oral cavity. This sounds like hard work and the success rate is very low. Only about 2.5% will go on to establish a long-lived colony. Little Penguin 
The little penguin is, well, a really small penguin. They come from New Zealand and the southern Australian coast and only grow between 30 to 33 centimeters. There isn't a whole lot to say about this one, it really is just a little penguin. They've been able to survive fairly scot-free for a long time, but the introduction of new predators like cats, dogs, and particularly ferrets have been a new problem for them. They've also been significantly affected by oil spills and other human developments, so that's pretty sad. Coral Reef Snake the coral reef snake, or just sea snake if you're feeling lazy, is a subfamily of marine snakes living in warm coastal waters in the Indian and Pacific Oceans. Most sea snakes are very venomous and very well suited to a fully aquatic lifestyle. Sea snakes have a paddle-like tail and move around like eels. They do still need to breathe air every now and again, and they do this through the top of their skin. Weird. Like other snakes, sea snakes are able to track the scent of their prey by flicking their tongue. Yes, this works even underwater. The nostrils have veils consisting of spongy tissue made to exclude water, and the windpipe can be drawn up where the short nasal passage opens into the roof of the mouth. In comparison, the actual action of the tongue flick is much shorter than that of the land snake. The trade-off for all of this is that all except one species is virtually helpless on land. As mentioned before, most sea snakes are highly venomous. The bites can be painless and go unnoticed, and it can take hours for symptoms to kick in. That may sound scary, and you really shouldn't mess with them, but sea snakes aren't known to be aggressive. They very rarely rarely bite humans. Roseate Spoonbill the roseate spoonbill is a big pink wading bird from the Americas. Just like flamingos, these spoonbills get their pink color from their diet, consisting of carotenoid pigment canthaxanthin. It feeds in shallow waters by swinging its bill side to side as it walks. That spoonbill literally acts like a spoon, picking up tiny crustaceans, mollusks, seeds, etc. The nostrils are located way up at the base of the bill, which means that the spoonbill can still breathe while it's wading. Plume hunting in the 18th and 19th centuries almost drove the roseate spoonbill to extinction, but that is a different story nowadays. Decades of conservation efforts, as well as a little dash of global climate change has allowed the spoonbill to greatly expand its territory. Reports said that the spoonbills have made their way all the way up to DC and New York. Some sightings claim to be as far north as Michigan, which like, wasn't me, I didn't see anything. Wrinkle-Faced Bat the wrinkle-faced bat is an ugly-looking bat from Central America. They're little guys, only weighing around 17 grams. The males have a special skin mask that can be used to cover that beautiful face. The skull is short and wide, which is believed to give the bat one of the strongest bite force relative to its size. Wrinkle-faced bats primarily eat fruit, but are not classified as fruit bats. Instead, go in with the leaf-nosed bat, who, big surprise, has a nose that looks like a leaf. That strong bite force in the wrinkle-faced bat helps them eat tougher fruits at times when soft fruits aren't as readily available. They even have a storage pouch in their mouth for holding fruit. Isn't that cute? Cookie Cutter Shark the cookie cutter shark is a small shark found in warm oceanic waters worldwide, and can be found at depths of 3.7 kilometers. Like a lot of deep sea predators, these sharks will come up from below when the sun goes down to hunt under the cover of darkness. They tend to go after larger animals, latching on and gouging out a signature round plug. The shark's mouth is surrounded by big fleshy suctorial lips that pair perfectly with those saw-like teeth. Cookie cutter sharks disguise themselves using bioluminescence to match any light coming down from above. This counter illumination makes them harder to spot as they hide any obvious shark silhouette. This works both ways too, as anything from above might mistake this trick as a school of smaller fish, letting the cookie cutter get up close for a snack. They don't just go after bigger fish though, cause cookie cutter sharks can open that mouth up wide to eat smaller things like whole squids. They also got big ol' eyes, good for seeing. Sea Monkey Sea monkeys are not actually monkeys, that's just a classic case of corporate advertising for you. No, they don't look like that. They're actually just a breed of brine shrimp sold as novelty pets. Apparently, the term sea monkey comes from the tail. I don't see it. Sea monkeys were artificially bred and are hybrids of a bunch of different species of Artemia. The company claims that they live longer than normal brine shrimp too, but I can't say if that's true or not. Sea monkeys undergo cryptobiosis. They come in completely dried up and will spring to life when you add water. Sea monkey eggs can stay dormant for years before exposed to water. They're their entire life cycle is about 8 to 10 weeks. Hey, it's a cool science experiment, I guess. Apparently, astronaut John Glenn took some sea monkeys to space in 1998 to, I don't know, see what would happen. After 9 days in space, they came home and hatched like nothing happened. However, earlier missions with sea monkeys that were exposed to significant cosmic rays didn't fare as well. Only 10% of those guys lived to adulthood. Gooey Duck no, that's not pronounced geoduck like it should be. It is, in fact, gooey duck. What even? So, just a heads up, I don't really know how I'm gonna edit this one. These guys look a little, a little odd at certain angles. A little like something I'm not supposed to show here. I don't really want to trip up the YouTube sensors, so forgive me if I'm a little liberal with the pictures here. 
The gooey duck is a large saltwater clam native to the coastal waters of Alaska to Baja, California. The shell of the clam is anywhere from 15 to 20 centimeters, but the siphon, and yes that's a siphon, could about triple the thing's total length. It is the largest burrowing clam in the world, which is a cool record to have I guess. They're also one of the longest living animals in the world, with the oldest specimen reaching 179 years old. They use that long siphon to suck down water containing plankton, filters the food, and then pushes what it doesn't need back out. Beautiful. For some reason, people really want to eat this clam, like that's an 80 million dollar industry of wanting to eat a clam. Gooey duck is regarded as an aphrodisiac, which is ironic. They're very popular in China and Korea, and even Japan isn't afraid to make some raw gooey duck sashimi, but I think I'll pass on that one. Fangtooth the fangtooth is a deep sea fish found worldwide. They get their name from their giant fangs, but they're actually pretty small, up to 16 centimeters, and they're harmless to humans. Fangtooths can prey upon much bigger fish than themselves owing to those large teeth as well as wide opening jaw. Those fangs are so big that they've evolved an opposing set of pockets for the fangs to slide into all snug. It's thought that only adults target other fish. This is because juveniles have smaller teeth and longer gill rakers, suggesting that they primarily filter zooplankton. Pelagic fangtooths are among the deepest living fish. They can be found as deep as 5,000 meters under the ocean and come up at night to hunt. Mountain Beaver Mountain beavers are not really beavers, they're just big rodents from North America. They do share a lot of similarities to beavers, like they have big teeth, strong odor, they like to live by water, they even gnaw on trees like beavers. Apparently they're more closely related to squirrels of all things. It's thought that mountain beavers can only live in the rainy region of America because they can't produce concentrated urine. They need to eat vegetation high in water content and in general consume large amounts of water just to do so, so they can't survive in areas that are much more arid. Mountain beavers don't like to go too far from their burrows, and they don't really like to hang out with other mountain beavers. They only get out to find food and water. They can climb trees though. Their thumbs are a little opposable. That's kind of neat. Java Mouse Deer the mouse deer is the smallest living ungulate, only reaching about 45 centimeters in length. They are thought to be the most primitive ruminants, based on their behavior and fossil records, and probably also size if I had to guess. The Java mouse deer is endemic to Java and Indonesia, and prefer living at higher elevations in the tropical rainforest. They like to make little tunnels out of bamboo that'll lead to food areas or resting areas. They'll go to areas dense in vegetation, and really just eat whatever plant food they find. Java mouse deer will form monogamous family groups, and are pretty shy and solitary animals. The males are a bit territorial, and will mark their territory by secreting from a scent gland under their chin. Also around this area you'll find the deer's long tusk-like canine teeth. They lack antlers like other deer, so they'll use these teeth instead to ward off threats or fight their rivals. Megamouth Shark the Megamouth Shark is a species of deep sea shark measuring around 5.2 meters long and with a mouth that can open as wide as 1.3 meters. Just like the other big mouth sharks we looked at on this iceberg, the Megamouth is a filter feeder and is actually the smallest of the three. Megamouth sightings are rare, but are distinct because of their huge head and rubbery lips. They got gill rakers to catch plankton and such, but in comparison to these two are relatively poor swimmers and are much less active. Unfortunately, not a whole lot is known about the Megamouth sharks. Like I said, they're very rare. They were only first seen in 1976, and since then, only 99 specimens have been sighted. Argentine Lake Duck Oh man, YouTube really isn't gonna let me get away with this one, are they? Alright, it's like the thing that ducks have become very infamous for online. Something something about a big corkscrew. If you know, you know. You probably already know, so we'll just move on. I guess one thing I can say is that it's red and it has a nice blue bill. That's pretty cool. And also they're from Argentina and Chile. Nice. Book Scorpion the book scorpion, also known as a persuado scorpion, sorry, pseudo scorpion, or false scorpion, are small scorpion like arachnids with these pincer like pedipalps and a flat body. They only get up to around 3 millimeters in length and are often mistaken for ticks or small spiders. Book scorpions use those pedipalps to inject venom into whatever smaller bug they catch. They don't have a cool tail stinger like true scorpions, but they can spin silk like spiders. Except, book scorpions spin silk from a gland in their jaws to make cocoons for mating, molting, or waiting out cold weather. They don't make webs like spiders. Book scorpions are generally beneficial to humans. They prey on a lot of common household pests and are so small that you probably wouldn't even notice it. But if you do happen to see one, maybe uh, think about keeping them around. Might be a cool roommate. Coelacanth Coelacanths are an ancient group of fish with the oldest known fossils being over 410 million years old. In fact, they were originally thought to have gone extinct around 66 million years ago in the late Cretaceous, but some were discovered off the coast of South Africa in 1938. Coelacanths are lobe-finned fish, which makes them more closely related to the lungfish and by extension amphibians, reptiles, and uh, us, than they are to ray-finned fish. 
Crazy. They are considered transitional species between fish and not fish. A little editor's note, fossil records show that the lungfish is our most recent shared ancestor with fish and that coelacanths had already split off before lungfish came to land. Still though, we are more closely related to these guys than you would think at first. Coelacanths are large fish growing over 2 meters. They move around with the water's current and can maneuver their body any which way due to their many fins scattered around the body. Coelacanths are estimated to live up to 100 years. Apparently they reach full maturity at 55 years. Wow, that is a long time. Leafy Sea Dragon The leafy sea dragon is a cool marine fish found off the southern and western coast of Australia. They have long protrusions that look like leaves to help them blend into seaweed and such, but they also use them to move around. Leafy sea dragons and seahorses have a lot in common, which makes sense because they're both in the same family. Just like the seahorse, leafy sea dragons suck down plankton and tiny crustaceans. They are a little bigger though, growing 20 to 24 centimeters, and can't use their tail to coil around things like seahorses can. Leafy sea dragons are very solitary, only coming together to mate. Newborns are completely independent from the moment they hatch and reach maturity after only two years. And just like the seahorse, it's the male's turn to get pregnant. Bald Uakari the bald uakari is a small new world monkey who has a bald head and beet red face. I won't give him too much hate though, cause he looks embarrassed enough already. They only live in heavily wooded forests close to water in the western Amazon. The bald uakari is arboreal and will climb over the water when the river floods during the rainy seasons and then look for washed up foods when it goes back down in the dry seasons. It has a powerful lower jaw that helps it crack open unripe fruits and nuts that other primates wouldn't be able to get at. That big beautiful red face is a sign of good health and signals to suitors a healthy mate. During mating season, female Females will draw males' attention by releasing an attractive scent from a sternal gland. Both males and females have this gland and use it for very smelly communication. Goblin Shark the goblin shark is a rare deep sea shark whose species is around 125 million years old. They can be found at depths greater than 100 meters, with some researchers saying they can reach as far as 1300 meters. The shark is rare though, found pretty sporadically around all these different coasts. Its pink skin and unfortunate side profile make the goblin shark easily identifiable. The shark's highly protrusable jaw and nail-like teeth help it catch other deep sea fish. It better be good at that too, cause that flabby body and small fins mean this guy ain't moving too fast. One thing that'll help with that is that long snout filled with tiny electric Electro sensors, giving the goblin shark the ability to sense electric fields made by nearby prey. Kind of an OP ability to have that far under the sea, but what do I know? Greenland Shark the Greenland shark is an important species of shark living in the cold waters of the North Atlantic and Arctic Oceans. It has the longest known lifespan of any vertebrate, estimated to live between 250 to 500 years. It is also among the largest known sharks at anywhere between 2.4 and 7 meters. To deal with their less than ideal environment, Greenland sharks have high concentrations of trimethylene N oxide in their tissues to increase buoyancy and help with sudden change in the water. This also has the added benefit of making the shark toxic to eat. The shark's long lifespan is probably due to their incredible slow metabolism. Greenland sharks have the slowest swim speed and tail beat frequency for its size of any fish. They're still apex predators in their habitat and hunt smaller sharks and other fish. There is a copepod, Omatocoeta elongata, that'll infest the green sharks by attaching themselves to their eyes. It's speculated that this relationship could be beneficial for the shark too, cause the copepod could display bioluminescence and attract fish for the shark to eat. But more research needs to be done on that. There is no way I'm gonna pronounce that right. This guy really needs an easier name. Anyway, this tiny frog is the world's smallest known vertebrate at 7.7 millimeters. I mean, just look at him on that dime. Now that's a small frog. This frog was only first discovered in 2009, which, I mean, makes sense. Not only is it tiny, but its color helps it blend in and any noise it makes would probably just sound like a bug. It was found in Papua New Guinea near Amau village, where it gets part of its name from. There's not a whole lot more to say about this one other than its size, but I guess I'll leave it off with this cool diagram comparing other frogs that are also smaller than a dime. Crazy. Ringed Sicilian the ringed Sicilian is a species of Sicilian, which are basically limbless snake-like amphibians, although this one kinda just looks like a big worm. They can be found all over South America, primarily anywhere east of the Andes. The ringed Sicilian measures 286 to 450 millimeters long. These amphibians have unique skin glands around their body that serve different specialized functions. Glands on the head excrete a lubricating mucus which helps them burrow. Meanwhile, at the tail region, skin glands are full of noxious chemicals that act as a poison defense from predators. Angel Shark Angel sharks are a group of sharks that live in sandy seabeds traditionally found all over the world. 
Unfortunately, many species are critically endangered as they are very sensitive to bottom trawling and are often caught by gill nets. Angel sharks' bodies are flat and have broad pectoral fins, which makes them often mistaken for rays. They are a bit smaller than other famous sharks, growing up to only 2.1 meters. Angel sharks are prone to deformities due to things like bad diet, bad genes, parasites, trauma, etc. But these don't seem to affect the shark all that much. Angel sharks hunt by burying themselves in the sand and then ambushing whatever comes by. Their extendable jaws can quickly snap upwards and have long needle-like teeth to make sure they ain't getting away. Although they may look fairly harmless to us, it could jump out and bite you if disturbed. With teeth like those, yeah, that's gonna hurt. Flying Frog so, flying frog is a general term for any frog that has the ability to glide. Apparently, there are 380 different species of flying frogs all around the world and from much different evolutionary backgrounds. So here we're gonna hone in on one, Wallace's flying frog. This is a type of moss frog from Southeast Asia who's gained the ability to glide by opening up its long webbed feet. They can be found high in the trees and parachute themselves from tree to tree to look for prey or when threatened. They have big toe pads that help them land and stick to walls. Wallace's flying frogs are anywhere from 80 to 100 millimeters meters in length, so they primarily catch insects. It is the largest frog in its genus, but it still falls prey to things like tree climbing snakes. Females create bubble nests and branches are on foliage above the water. Babies will hatch and develop in the nests until it breaks up and they fall into the water to continue their life. Sarcastic Fringe Head the sarcastic fringe head is a crazy looking saltwater fish found in the northeast pacific. The first thing that you'll notice about this fish is that it can extend its mouth way out in a manner that is perfect for a thumbnail moment. They are tough and aggressively territorial. When fringe heads battle, they wrestle by pressing their gaping mouths together until one is able to bite the other's head. The sarcastic fringe head is a type of tube blenny and likes to hide away in shells, crevices, or some man-made objects. The fish can get up to 30 centimeters long and swims kinda weird in fast short darts. They are predatory fish and are particularly fond of squid eggs, eating a large number of them during their spawning season. Atlas Moth the atlas moth, endemic to forests in Asia, is one of the biggest lepidopterans with a wingspan up to 24 centimeters and a wing surface area of 160 centimeters squared. These moths are a type of silk moth, and as such, the females are noticeably bigger than the males, while the males have broader antennae. Atlas moths start off life as this little spiny caterpillar that'll spin a long papery cocoon with silken leaves. After about four weeks, a big beautiful moth will emerge. Despite their massive wings, adult atlas moths are fairly weak flyers and must conserve energy during the day. Fully grown adults have lost their mouth parts and must survive entirely on fat reserves accumulated during their larval stage. They only live for a few days at this stage, so their sole purpose is finding a mate. They gotta make this quick, so females release pheromones through a gland on their abdomen so males can hone in on them with their big antenna. Pygmy Marmoset Pygmy marmosets are New World monkeys from the rainforests of the western Amazon basin. They are the smallest primates in the world, measuring at 117 to 152 millimeters in length. These monkeys are short and poofy with raccoon-like tails. Pygmy marmosets live in little family groups, sometimes with some extra adults. These groups are well known for their communication abilities, being able to signal any scenario to one another through calls, chemical smells, and visual signals. Parental care is also shared by the whole group. Pygmy marmosets are arboreal and use their claw-like nails to cling onto branches. They can rotate their head 180 degrees to keep a lookout. These marmosets have specialized incisors made to gouge trees and stimulate sap flow, with tree gum being their main source of food. They'll also sometimes eat insects like butterflies who get a little too curious about that sappy smell. False Killer Whale the false killer whale is, you guessed it, not a whale. It's actually a really big dolphin found in tropical regions worldwide. The name comes from the fact that they kinda look like killer whales. In particular, their skulls are very similar. You know, not that you would be able to tell by looking. These dolphins reach a maximum length of 6 meters. They form pods up to 50 members, sometimes with other species of dolphins. These interspecies relationships can be very close, but still, the false killer whale has been known to eat other dolphins, so, I don't know. Typical dolphin activity if you ask me. Those guys are not what they seem, trust me. False killer whales differ from normal killer whales in that they prefer to eat swordfish and other smaller fish or squid. They have a max speed of 28.8 kilometers an hour and have been documented diving as far as 927.5 meters. False killer whales are very sociable with other species, and that goes for humans too. They've been noted as being very easy to train and have been kept at public aquariums all over the world. False killer whales in the wild have been seen offering fish to divers or boaters, that's nice, but they've also seen a bit of a decline from getting hooked accidentally by fishers, that's not so nice. Prevost Squirrel 
Prevo squirrel is a colorful squirrel from the Malay Peninsula and some neighboring islands. Like most squirrels, Prevo squirrel is pretty adaptable to a number of habitats and can often be found in gardens or other human developed areas. Prevo squirrel is one of the larger squirrels in its area, reaching 20 to 27 centimeters in body length with a tail about the same size. They are easily identified by their color patterns, usually being a mix of reddish orange, white, and black, although some subspecies will look a bit different. Other than that, they're pretty much your average squirrel. They climb trees, make nests out of twigs, eat eat nuts, berry seeds, etc. Desmond the Desmond is a small type of mole from Europe that has a big tail and long snout. There are two different species of Desmond, with the bigger Russian Desmond reaching about 20 centimeters in body length. Desmonds are unique from other moles because they are not all that good at digging. Instead, their paws are webbed and made for diving underwater to find food. They still retain some sharp claws on their feet for catching prey. Desmonds move awkwardly on land, but are swift swimmers. Both the ear holes and nostrils can close underwater, and they can even use that long snout to probe the bottom. They are nocturnal, so during the day will shelter in crevices among stones and roots and stream banks. Wilson's Bird of Paradise Wilson's Bird of Paradise is a species of passerine bird endemic to Indonesia. It lives in hills and lowland rainforests on islands off West Pawpaw. The bird has a set of wildly different colors going on all over its body and these funny twirly tail feathers. Males will clear a spot in the forest to perform an elaborate mating dance to impress a potential mate. He'll hop on a vertical branch in the middle and start flexing that bright green collar while calling out. Females will perch above and judge the male by many factors, like stature, sound, how vibrant his colors are, etc. Big Headed Turtle The Big Headed Turtle is a species of turtle from Southeast Asia that has, wouldn't you know, a big head. In fact, the head of this turtle is so big that it can't retract it into its shell. Instead, the head itself is armored and it also has a sharp beak which it isn't afraid to use when threatened. The Big Headed Turtle is not a particularly good swimmer like other turtles. Turns out that these turtles are more of a hiker slash climber than a swimmer. It has a long tail that it uses to prop itself up and strong claws for grabbing. They move mostly during the night and will travel up to 89.6 meters. The Big Headed Turtle is critically endangered as they are frequently found in illegal wildlife trade and pet trade. Common Spotted Cuscus The Common Spotted Cuscus is a marsupial that lives in New Guinea and Cape York at the tip of Australia. Being about the size of a normal house cat, this Cuscus is well known for having a spotted coat. Only males will have these spots, and females are usually all white or gray. The Spotted Cuscus is a shy, slow-moving tree climber that has a long prehensile tail coupled with strong, curved claws that help it grip. They typically live alone in dense wooded areas where it can find a wide variety of plants to eat. Males mark their territory with their scent gland, and if they encounter another male, they can act very aggressively. Despite Despite being hunted for their pelt, the common spotted cuscus is still common in most of its natural habitat and does quite well for itself when introduced to any nearby islands. Olm the Olm is a species of fully aquatic salamander that lives its life entirely in caves or underground. The Olm lives only in caves found in Europe and has many adaptations for life in complete darkness. The Olm is blind, only having photoreceptors to sense light, but its hearing and sense of smell are very well developed. Olms can sense sound waves in the water and vibrations on the ground. It lacks any pigmentation in its skin, leaving it sort of a fleshy pink. They also might be able to sense electric fields emitted from their environment and may be able to use the Earth's magnetic field to orient itself. Olms carry a lot of characteristics from their larval stage into adulthood, most notably their disproportionate number of toes on their front and back legs, as well as their external gills, a trait shared with the axolotl from the first tier. Long Waddled Umbrella Bird the long waddled umbrella bird is a black bird with a Josuke looking hairdo and a big necktie hanging down. It is a rare bird that lives in wet cloud forests of Colombia and Ecuador. That necktie is actually called a throat waddle and only the males have one. The length of the waddle can be controlled and can be retracted during flight. The waddle is used to amplify their voice and gives them a big booming call. <coughs> These umbrella birds aren't great flyers because of their size and size of accessories. They find it easier to hop or climb around from branch to branch with their more reliable clawed toes. They feed mostly on large fruits but will catch bugs and other small animals if they happen across one. Baiji the Baiji is a possibly extinct species of freshwater dolphin from the Yangtze River in China. Although it is officially listed as critically endangered with a possibility of extinction, the Baiji is thought to be the first dolphin driven to extinction because of human impact. It hasn't been seen in 40 years. Reaching a max length of 2.5 meters, the Baiji is distinguished by its low triangular dorsal fin. They can reach a max speed of 60 kmh but have poor vision, so they have to rely on sonar for navigation. This sonar also plays a key role in socializing with the group and coordination. Central American Agoti 
The Central American agote is a big species of rodent spanning the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico all the way down to Peru. It is usually reddish brown to orange in color and share a lot of resemblance to a capybara but with these twiggy legs. They are shy animals that usually only live in pairs. At night, these agotes will find a hollow tree trunk or burrow to rest in. Apparently, the Central American agote has one of the best senses of smell out there. Their snouts are full of olfactory receptors which the agotes use to find nuts and seeds to eat. Sacred Scarab the sacred scarab is a round black species of dung beetle found in Europe, Africa, and Asia. Much of its distribution is near the Mediterranean or Black Sea, where it inhabits dunes or marshes. The dung beetle is distinguished by its head, which has six little grooves that help with digging or rolling dung. The sacred scarab is a dung beetle, and as such will collect dung and roll it into a ball. Once the scarab finds a nice spot, it'll hide inside its ball of dung and eat it for several days. Females ready to breed are especially particular with the quality of dung they roll up, because she's going to be putting her babies in there so that they can eat it when they hatch. Isn't nature beautiful? Sacred scarabs get their name from being venerated by the ancient Egyptians. They were thought to symbolize Kepri, an early morning god who rolled the sun into the sky, much like our little scarab friends, rolling what, to a dung beetle, may as well be as important as the sun. Galago the Galago, or bush baby, is a small nocturnal primate from sub-Saharan Africa. It has big eyes to help see at night and bat-like ears for tracking insects to eat. Being a fast and agile climber, the Galago can snatch bugs on the ground or out of the air. To help climb, Galagos have strong hind legs and long tails to maintain balance. The second toe on their hind legs has a grooming claw and they have comb-like incisors, both for grooming. Females usually stick together along with their young in social groups, but males will leave to go off on their own when they hit puberty. One thing to note about Galagos is that they are really good jumpers. They are something like 6 to 9 times better than frogs relative to each's weight, and reach up to 2.25 meters. This ability could come from their elastic energy storage and their back leg tendons that sort of spring up, and this is assisted by their long balance keeping tail. Horned Viper the horned viper is a venomous species of viper found in the deserts of northern Africa and Arabia. It reaches a max length of 85 centimeters, with the females typically larger than the males. They blend into the sand and move through the desert looking to ambush rodents, geckos, or birds. The big distinguishing feature of these guys, from which the horned viper gets its name, are these horn-like protrusions over each eye. Sometimes they are absent, but in general, these horns are bigger in males and make them way scarier if you happen to already be afraid of snakes. Horned vipers can make a sizzling, scraping sound by rubbing their strongly keeled scales together. This can be a warning to their venom, which can be lethal to humans. Cleaner fish. The cleaner fish is a species of fish that will go into much bigger fish species referred to as clients and pick at dead skin, parasites, infections, etc. Since this little guy is providing an invaluable service, the bigger fish won't eat them. This mutually beneficial relationship can be seen in a wide variety of marine life from wrasse to cichlids to gobies and even aquatic reptiles, mammals, or octopus. Clients will congregate at specific areas called cleaning stations and perform specific movements to let the cleaner fish know that it wants some service. These cleaning stations are usually in coral reefs which allow for a safe space without risk of predation. Cleaner fish can even remember regulars for whom they've already built a trusting customer relationship with. The funny thing about cleaner fish is that there is a totally different species of false cleaner fish that look identical to regular cleaner fish. These imposters will use the goodwill of their lookalikes to sneak in and grab a quick bite or maybe just use the bigger fish for protection. And that's the end of tiers 5 and 6. If you made it this far, then I want to get your guys' take on something. I've been running into a problem where I'll have very little to say about some animals, or some entries will be very similar to something I already talked about, and that's led to some really short or lackluster segments. I don't really want to skip over anything, because I do want to get through every animal on this iceberg, so if you guys got any suggestions on what to do to spruce up an otherwise lacking entry, I'd love to hear it. With that being said, I gotta thank you all for watching all the way to the end. I hope you enjoyed this part. You know, what animals did you think were cool and all that? I'm really curious to hear it. Thanks for bearing with me. I know this part took a long time to come out. I mean, the whole series moved to a separate channel, so it may not look like it took a while to new viewers, but trust me, I have been very slow, and I do greatly appreciate everyone patience uh but yeah thanks for watching